Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Osri 2020. I'm Kellen Krauss with the New York State Police. I want to start off by saying thank you to Esri for letting me be, be part of this very special day. And thank you to all of you for tuning in and uh, lending me an ear and hearing and learning what we're doing over in the US, particularly in New York State, with uh, geospatial information and geospatial science and how it really helps us in our mission. Um, so where we are uh, in New York, first off, the New York State Police, we are responsible for all of New York State. We have jurisdiction everywhere, but largely it's along the highways. It's in more of the rural suburban areas. Um, the local police departments cover most of their crime and most of their patrolling. We do have partnerships with each of those cities where we work on special enforcement teams, maybe work on larger investigations, uh, but we let them handle the general calls for emergency services and uh, patrolling the streets. Uh, as you can see, New York City, almost eight and a half million people living within New York City and approximately 35,000 police officers are part of their force. Our staff is only around 5,000, which is no small thing in itself, but we, we let New York City largely handle their own while we do still have some of those partnerships to work with them on fraud investigations, maybe some organized crime. Most of our work is outside of New York City uh, in those, as I said, rural and suburban areas. When it comes to law enforcement in the US and GIS, it's an interesting kind of relationship. Law enforcement is one of the most old school industries that are out there. You get some people who are a little resistant to change, resistant to new things, definitely resistant to technology. Uh, we're one of the ones that I'm sure drive every nuts because when we're setting up ArcGIS online, we still wanna create these PDFs and we wanna be able to create these single documents that we need, whether we're out in, in the middle of the forest or we're going into court and we need to present our findings. One benefit we do have is that Police officers really understand space. They really do understand the idea that everything happens somewhere and it has a relation to everything going on around it. They love the old school paper map that you can put down on the hood of a car and just take markers and say, did the bad guy go this way through the woods or the fire is approaching this neighborhood? How can we uh, set up and get people out? We need to understand that space. So those two things do work well together. While they can be a little behind the times, a little behind on a lag, they're very open to viewing information through, through a map. It's a beautiful way to share really what's going on. Um, where I come into the, the play here is I'm not a, a data scientist like many of you are. I'm not a cartographer by trade, but through trainings and experience over the years, um, I've become the map guy for New York State Police. And it's, I think it's a really great opportunity today to talk about how these concepts and this information can be so important outside of, of the true experts in the field, how we, in a, in a different world in law enforcement, it can really drive our mission and just improve the decisions we make every day. And it's vitally important to us. Uh, today, I'm going to go through some of the methods we've used and particularly some of the tools we've used in both criminal cases and overall strategic practices and just how important they've been to what we do. So our first step, I want to really emphasize uh, time and space, as we say right here, how we know the spatial aspect, but also the time and how they play together. So we have a criminal case here as an example. This was a gas station armed robbery that took place in the winter of 2017. As you can see, there's a lot of snow on the ground, but for us, eh, that's, that's kind of a light dusting. We get quite a bit up here. Um, in this case, uh, it took place in what we call the North Country of New York State. It's uh, further up north, close to our border with Canada. It's a very wooded, very uh, forested, mountainous area. Well, a 911 call comes in, our emergency line, for an armed robbery at this gas station at 10.16 a.m. The victim was able to give the officers a description of the suspect, 
and was able to describe the vehicle that left. They were actually able to even identify the license plate on the back of the car. Huge help to us. You'll see here when they looked for cameras in the area a little bit later at 10.36 a.m. further south, they actually caught that vehicle going by. So that gives us one hint that that vehicle is really there. They were able to take that license plate and identify a potential suspect, the registered owner of that vehicle. Then through legal process, they were able to obtain location information for that suspect's mobile device. Now comes in our world. These records come in in huge formats, not always very clean, not very friendly. And the analysts step in to try to make sense of this and see, does our evidence match up with our crime? So here we have a video of just the time, really the time factor of our data points. Uh, we load that in, we hit play on it, we messed around with our time slider a little bit, but I, at first I just wanted to eyeball it, hit play on it, and what does the story tell me? Well, this vehicle be began very far north, up on our border with Canada. So a solid, at minimum, two hours away from the crime location. We see it continued south, drove directly by our robbery location, and then continued all the way down to New York City. So now we know that the suspect's vehicle and the suspect's mobile device both went by the crime. But do we know if they were really there, like when it happened? Were they there long enough? Could it have been them? So then we, we dive in just a little bit deeper. And I wanted to look at that data around that time. Uh, first off, I had run a kernel density on it to get an idea of where does it stop. And it looked like our robbery was a significant place. We have that density there. Most of our points are. But here's an example. I actually took a selection a little further north along that highway and a little further south, just for reference. And we saw that the car is zooming right through there, not within an area for more than a minute or so because they're driving along a highway. No big surprise. But we go right around our robbery location a little before pulling into the station and out. And we looked at that data. As you can see, we have 50 data points here, and those records actually began at 9.47 a.m. and continued to 10.18, two minutes after the 911 call came through. That's a conspicuously long amount of time to spend at a gas station. I actually ran a test on this the other day. I left work. I went over to our gas station. I hit the timer or the timer on my phone soon before I pulled in. Got out without hurrying, filled up my tank. Then I put my mask on, I went inside, I bought a couple things just to simulate if this was a longer stay, somebody went in. I paid, went out, got back in my car, pulled out of the parking lot. And all of that was in about seven and a half minutes. To go from seven and a half minutes to 31 minutes, that, that, that really matches up. That's very conspicuous. We have the vehicle identified, we have the phone there, and honestly, the suspect fit the description that was given by our victim, the person who was working at the gas station. So this really nails down, this is our person. You arm all that information when you go into an interview or you take that to a judge for an arrest warrant, and we really filled out the information of what happened in this incident. The next step, I wanna look at how we look at um, drug trafficking trends the New York State Police. This is a pretty new process we've used using some stuff from the crime analysis solution. We're using the incident path for trafficking trends. Right here, we have drug interdiction data. That's arrests made where a suspect was um, transporting large amounts of drugs or firearms through or to New York State. Here, we've mapped out just the arrest location as well as we debrief those suspects for where did they begin and where were they headed. Uh, where, where are our origin destinations and our uh, the intended destination? When we throw all that on the map, it's just a big old mess. There's all our dots. We need to give context to this. We want to really see what does this information mean? This is what we talk about being that data rich, but how do we use it? So we ran that incident path tool based off of our origin and our destination to see, is there a trend in where our people are moving? You kind of see a blob where we are in the lower Hudson Valley which is just north of New York City. We know that's a heavy area, we can really tell here, but we need to know more about it. We know that a lot has to do with New York City, 
but we found that digging deeper into the data shows that New York City is very much an origin destination for these trafficking arrests. Um, drugs are coming in, whether it's through the mail or through the airlines or potentially through New Jersey, since we don't have jurisdiction there, it's very close, starting there. But people aren't delivering these drugs from outer uh, and upstate down into the city. It's moving out from there. So we need to know how can we stop them when they're moving that way. Here we have that line, but I think we need a little more context. This doesn't take into effect the arrest location, which is a crucial third point. So we broke it into two different incident paths. We went from origin to arrest and arrest to destination. The goal there is to add what I keep calling an elbow to it to give you a little uh, better idea of what routes are being taken. Uh, we know these people aren't traveling as the crow flies. So we wanna know, uh, this gives a little more context of again, what road or what highways they may be taken. Again, here, it's, it's a lot of lines overlapping, but we're getting a better idea. But we need to make sense of all these lines. So then we ran a line density on, the, on this data. The line density really starts to tell us some more, but let's add in highways for a little bit of context. So here are the major highways within the state of New York. Now I think we're seeing a little more. We do have coming up um, I-87, which is this northbound highway from New York City. We also have a, a pretty busy road over here, the Taconic uh, State Parkway. Uh, and we're also seeing, we're actually getting some trafficking that goes east to west through New York, but not necessarily with a destination there. So we know we're busy there, but the thing, we need to dig deeper, not necessarily with a tool, but really look at this for what's important. What I can show you right here is this a State Route 17 coming right through here from that dark spot up northwest up to those highways? That's a lesser used road. And we can see that our traffickers are taking that road or likely taking that road. Is that because they're trying to avoid more of our officers? Is it because it's likely, you can see here, it's a shortcut to get out west? So it tells me right there, we need to focus more of our, uh, not necessarily patrols, but our special operations on that area. We see a little, a little bit out west here where Buffalo is. There's not a lot of trafficking going out that way. Not that much, even though it's the second biggest city in the state of New York, not that much is coming up from New York City. So potentially they're getting their drugs and guns from Pittsburgh, from Cleveland, from Detroit, a little further west. We also see this flat highway across the top that's interstate 90 it goes from boston all the way to see all the way to seattle on the pacific coast that is one of the biggest commuter roads in our state and we're not getting a lot of evidence of uh these shipments going that way they come north out of the city and up to here where this is albany this is our capital region where i work or they're taking the shortcut to the northwest so it tells us we need to take some of our patrols and some of our major operations off 90 and we need to take down to that smaller area, we can get more bang for our buck. There's less commuters on that road and a higher frequency of these trafficking uh, incidents going on. So we need to, we can focus our operations there and really try to take out this threat to New York. Also within the crime analysis solution, something that has become very big for us in the last few years is the uh, cell tower analysis tools. Um, when Esri was developing these in 2019, they were actually released in the uh, June 2019 uh, update when this solution was let out. Um, New York State Police and myself were asked to act as beta testers for this tool. We'd already been using cell tower mapping, uh, particularly in old ArcMap. We dug out a, a Python script that could run this uh, to help with a lot of our cases. And when Esri came to us, we were excited to help. And when it came out, it was huge for us. It sped up so much of our work. And now uh, many of our cases end up map mapping out this kind of evidence because it's so powerful. So the three tools for this, um, it, it's three breakdown within the solution or within the tool. Uh, the first is importing the cell sites. This is essentially, we write a warrant out to our cell phone carrier and they give us back uh, data for our suspect. And right, the first one is where are the towers? We load this into the software, we run the import cell sites, and it quite simply maps out where the towers are. Well, for New York State, that's 2,583 towers 
mapped across all of upstate New York and a little bit of northern Pennsylvania. I think that took me three minutes to map. And with some of your more powerful computers, depending what you have, it'd be even better. But that took no time at all, and it really laid out the context, the towers and the sides. Our next tool goes into, we import the cell phone records. We essentially match them up. We got our towers, we put in the cell phone records. Now tell me where our bad guy was. As you can see here, they have that kind of fan. They give you an idea of the coverage. If our crime location is over here on that purple triangle, we know that they hit off of the tower near that triangle and they actually use the side facing that. Um, cell towers we know kind of cover for each other and kind of can kind of branch out, but that uh, it really helps our, our case. It doesn't necessarily nail down, but you pair that with other evidence and interviews, and it's a fantastic visual element of uh, how these work. The third tool is the generate cell sector lines. What that essentially does is it, uh, it expands these sectors. When you really look at them, you'll see um, they, they don't just cover that area. If you're in a particularly rural area, a tower may go 13, 15 miles. These sectors are set to two miles, which you can actually set in the, in the tool, in the import cell site tool. If you're in like New York City, you have the, the issue of, uh, well, there's so many towers that are really cut down. So there's no way you're going two miles. You're lucky if it's a half mile, but it really gives context. Um, one example that I had thought of that really I think applies is, uh, well, for Australia, is let's say we've got um, robberies going on in, it's some of our gas station robberies going on in Newcastle. And we have a suspect, but we know that they live in Sydney. Those two areas, they're close, but they're not. So our suspect, maybe we can't say they're specifically at the location when they're hitting off towers outside Newcastle, but when they try to give you that alibi and tell you, well, I was home all night, I absolutely wasn't there, we can very clearly tell that's lying because it's it's too far away. It's kilometers away, there's no way, there's no way they were there. And they can take that into an interview and really get some more information. The last tool I'm going to be talking about is our use of dashboards. Uh, this is one not set up by us. It's set up by some of our federal partners, and it helps us uh, really look at the opioid epidemic, epidemic within really all of the U.S. This is a nationwide uh, effort. We signed on in 2018. They opened up in 2017. It's voluntary for agencies to come on. It's not just law enforcement, but also some public health partners. Uh, EMTs and hospitals can uh, participate in this. Essentially, when first responders show up to uh, an overdose uh, incident, they pull out their phone, they open the app, which is actually on a survey one, two, three uh, base, and they fill out. Uh, I, at this time, I, I responded to an overdose. It finds the GPS. Uh, did the person survive? Did you uh, give them naloxone, which is a life-saving drug for uh, particularly its anti-opioid? And um, what is the suspected drug they may have uh, overdosed on? You could use more than just uh, for heroin. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, a video of that while I talk about, we can also set spike alerts for this. So we can set for a county, how many overdoses in a small amount of time is, is a significant warning to us uh, that we need to respond. So when we do have a spike over a weekend, then uh, where we are at state police, we can reach out to within one city, we can talk to the Rochester City Police, the Monroe County Sheriff's Department and the hospitals and say, each of you submitted two overdoses or one overdose. Can you tell me what you know? And maybe the police department has a phone number for the, for the suspect who, who sold the drugs. Maybe the sheriff's department knows uh, a potential, uh, a nickname of the drug dealer. And maybe the family of the victim knows some, some people they know in the city that they might have gotten it from. We reach out to all of them uh, real time because we've gotten that spike alert. And we put the pieces together so that whether it's state police or those local partners can go out, close that case, make that arrest and get what they call a hot batch that those particularly dangerous drugs that are even worse than the normal really out on the street and, and go and shut that down and protect other people before it could get to them. Here, as I said, playing this video of how the OD, 
map dashboard is laid out. We've got all those filters over on our right, looking at uh, our dates. Uh, you can break down by, was it a fatal or a non-fatal incident? We can look at agencies or counties or really even states as this is uh, national data. Uh, you might notice from the date filter, I have this going back to March. That was the beginning of the New York State stay at home orders. So during this live play, I wanted you to be able to see some of the spikes and some of the high days and where we're seeing those overdoses in that time. We have these totals over here on the left that really lay it out and we have our charts. This is important for us because we can share this out with our executives and they can make real time decisions and really smooth things out for us on our end. While we can be doing those alerts and getting that information, they can do all the statistical work themselves. Uh, really diving in, if they wanna look at a specific county, they don't have to reach out to our office and ask for specific data or mapping requests. It's all live. It's there for the governor's office or for my command staff to, uh, to answer any questions they really need about what's going on when it comes to the overdoses and this horrible drug epidemic we're, we're going through. So I do wanna to touch on some of the things we're moving into as we start to kind of close out uh, the future of where we're going with New York State Police and with geospatial information. Um, we've recently uh, started working with tasks in ArcGIS Pro to automate some of those weekly and daily reports that we're regularly putting out. Whether it's um, shootings that have happened statewide over a weekend, whether it's arrests of someone with a firearm, arrests of somebody with drugs, we can take that information and we plug it all into tasks so that then I have other analysts in my unit who may not have as much experience with ArcGIS or geospatial information in general. I can set that up and I can program it with all the instructions laid out in there. I can have all the tools ready to run, pointed directly at those source files, and they don't have to worry about clicking on one thing and choosing the wrong tool, adding data from the wrong thing, and then calling me if I'm off and uh, trying to figure out how to fix this. With those tasks all plugged in, they've saved me so much headache as the lead analyst, and they've saved us hours of man hours of putting together these weekly and daily reports that we're regularly asked for. Um, one more that we're going with, uh, we're starting to move into model builder. Um, we're really using this one for our firearms recoveries, our firearms arrests. Uh, we're particularly trying to use um, RTS's capability to identify, let's say two to four guns that are, are, that are covered, let's say in the city of Buffalo, New York, way out west where we are. And we look at the trace information for those firearms and they were originally purchased together down in the Southern United States, maybe in Georgia, uh, but also within a few months of each other. So we're starting to see some kind of trend here, some kind of tendency, and we can see that with the geospatial, we can run tools that say, oh, these were seized within five miles of each other and they were purchased within a hundred miles of each other. And by analyzing that data in bulk and having Model Builder run those tools for us, we can quickly identify which are the firearms that are moving across those state lines to New York, where we actually have very, very tight firearm laws, and um, hopefully identify a, a pattern, a trend, and find that criminal organization who's moving those firearms. Um, that, uh, that covers where we're going, where, what we've been using right now. I want to thank you again uh, for having me. This is an incredible experience, and I just want to learn from all of you while we're sharing what we're doing. Uh, have a wonderful day, and enjoy the rest of the conference.